This video is brought to you by BetUS Sportsbook and Casino. Raider Nation, welcome back to Silver and Black today in Odyssey Sports' original podcast covering the Las Vegas. You can also hear us on the weekends on Sunday, game day on KDWN, excuse me, on 101.5 FM, KDON, and on 98.5, The Bet in Las Vegas. The Bet Las Vegas is also a great station on HD2 if you have that stuff you're rolling around in your your Benz or your Ferrari in Vegas or, you know, whatever you're driving and you got HD2 on the radio, you can listen to us there too as well. But thanks for coming back and being with us. If you don't already subscribe to the podcast, do us a big favor. Mo and I need you to subscribe and put on the auto download wherever you get your audios where you can find us. And if you're watching us on video, hit the subscription notification bell and also comment, you know, let us know what you think. Even if you don't like what we're saying, go ahead. Tell us. We, 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 we listen to everybody. We take back every once in a while. We'll even respond to you. Actually, we respond a lot. So do that as well. Today, we're going to talk about, obviously, the Raiders game against the, the Minnesota Vikings, the first preseason game. What did we see? What went well? What didn't? We will get through all of that in segment number two. We're going to talk about the depth. What did we find out from this? We're going to talk quarterback first, of course. But then we're going to talk a little bit about some other areas that we noticed, Mo and I kind of compared notes. We're going to get into that. And our third segment is, of course, the voice of the fan. That is the Raider Nation mailbag. We're going to get to your calls. we got some calls, obviously, people watching the game. They're going to tell us what they think, and we're going to answer them as well as a text. Text. If you want to be part of that, you can always call in 702-900-7869. 702-900-7869 is the number. Raiders lose 24-23. to That doesn't really matter. It's a preseason game. Remember, Josh McDaniels, folks was six and one in the preseason. And where did that get you? So don't worry about the wins or losses in the preseason. It's more about what did we see? And Mo, here's where I want to start, buddy. By the way, Mo is the national NFL senior writer over at Bleacher Report. You can follow him on uh, X at Mo Moton, M-O-E-M-O-T-O-N. I am at LV Gully and the show is SNB today. He's also the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. So you can catch his work there where you can also catch my work. Okay, Mo, enough of the, 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 the personal plugs that I got in there for us. Uh, but here's the deal. Um, you look at what happened on Saturday. I thought there was a lot of encouraging things, and I want to get into those overall. But I want to ex- you know, I think when you look at the preseason, you have to be very meticulous in what you look at. You can't look at of all of it together. It's not like a regular season game. You're not facing top-notch offenses or their top-notch offensive play calls. It's very vanilla defense. Then you start playing against backups. And, hey, all the teams do it. No big deal. Doesn't mean the quarterback can't look. It doesn't mean a running back can't look good. But when you start to look at, and let's start at the very top, 50,000-foot level, my friend, when you look at this Raiders' performance, versus the Vikings, um, what did you see overall, and 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 how would you rate that performance based on uh, the individual, uh, I think, units and what they were able to do against the Vikings? If I were to grade the performance, I would give it about a B minus. Mm-hmm. Uh, not because there are more minuses than pluses, but I'll get into the top things, right? So the, the most refreshing thing or the most positive sign is the quarterbacks were a lot better in the preseason than they were at practices. So Mm -hmm. that's a positive sign. I think I mentioned this before that the quarterback competition would heat up in the preseason. Aiden O'Connell played well in the preseason last year. Garner Minshew has seen a bunch of vanilla defenses. He knows how to pick apart uh, a simplistic defense. So I expected both quarterbacks to play well, and they did. Now, if you want to nitpick it a bit, you can say Garner Minshew left the pocket a little too quick on, on some plays. Eight and O'Connell went seven and nine. Now he now he did take a sack. Part of that is on Andrew Speed, who gave up the sack to Dallas Turner. But again, I think the quarterbacks are the biggest takeaway here on the positive side. Both played well. The other thing is, usually, as I just mentioned, offense coordinators teams are very conservative or very vanilla in the preseason. But Luke mm-hmm. Getzey, right out of the gate, showed what he could do with Brock Bowers. And I think that's yes. a, that's a big sign. We saw Brock Bowers line up in a slot. We saw him line up in I formation. We saw him line up out wide at wide receiver. So seeing Brock Bowers all over the formation, getting two catches for 25 yards, great sign for his 2024 rookie outlook. On the defensive side of the ball, I think the few people that question, I think we had a caller or two that said, is Jack Jones really a cornerback one? Is he really a lead cornerback? Yes, sir. He showed it, baiting in uh, J.J. McCarthy on that pick, and he showed that he, he is cornerback one. 
Now, after that, Jacorian Bennett still, I think, has the pole position for the cornerback two spot. Now, obviously, Nate Hobbs in the slot. Now, on the negative side, the Raiders need some depth in the secondary. They need yes. to sign a Dory Jackson today because <laughs> behind your starters, if one of those starters goes down and you got to have the Cameron Richardson or Sam Webb or, or MJ Devonshire there, and I like MJ Devonshire, it could be a problem. The Raiders need depth in the secondary. The other thing really quick, Scott, is the run defense. Whether the starters were in or the backups were in, they need to have – they need to beef up their defensive line or someone has to step up to be able to stop the run could be a problem during the regular season yeah and and we're going to talk about the some of the depth issues in segment two going back to the quarterback battle you know you, you look at it and you say yeah both quarterbacks looked fine they look good um and again just as i had i think posted on x i said hey look you know the rookie quarterbacks they all look pretty good oh they're playing seconds well so were the raiders quarterbacks right except for the first drive when uh aiden o'connell who looked good as well very crisp Stepped up in the pocket. I was great to see the movement, Mo, Mo, right? He was moving up in the pocket. And I think to me, that was a key point. And then you look at Gardner Minshew. He does what he does. I mean, Gardner Minshew, we've seen it for five years. Like nothing there surprises me. He had a couple balls sail on him. That just happens. That's who he is. Uh, and so when you look at this and you think about what um, what they were able to accomplish there, but then also what they were able to do and what, Antonio Pierce said after the game in the press conference, he basically said after the next game, he'll probably name a starter. He said after game number two, I think he already knows who that starter is. And it's very interesting. I still think he's going to side with Aiden O'Connell, but I think both these guys are going to play. I don't think there's going to be a one, you know, a, uh, an a one quarterback. I think they're going to be one and one a all year round. And depending on what's going on, they're going to flip flop back and forth. I think they're both not, top line starting quarterbacks now they did well and that was a good sign to your point what we heard coming out of practice but i think what's going to happen is aiden o'connell still needs to develop his voice and i say voice in the leadership we talked about this a couple shows ago did we not the fact that a quarterback has to be more than just a player on the field that executes of course you got to do that but you got to be the dude and we already know gardner Minshew can do that now gardner Minshew isn't the most talented quarterback in the world but he is that guy so I think that's why you'll see this, depending who's got the hot hand, depending who commands the leadership on the field. So it's going to be real interesting to see what happens in practice this week, coupled with what happens against the Cowboys. You brought up an interesting point there that while Antonio Pierce announced that he's going to make a decision after the Cowboys game, you kind of think that maybe he already has his quarterback one. It's just a confirmation or does something you know out of the ordinary happen in that last preseason game to change his mind? And the question then is, if he's made up his mind already or has a QB1, who is it? And I think that mm. if you ask people in the chat, ask Raider fans out there, some people say Gardner Minshew because they look at his box score numbers, 6 of 12, 117 yards and a touchdown pass. But as I said, if you're, if you're a coach and you're looking at him bailing some of those pockets, some of those off-platform throws, remember, he only completed 50% of his passes. And O'Connell was more efficient. Gardner Minshew had more big plays. So it, yeah. it, it depends on what are the Raiders looking for for their offense? Who do they think is the better fit? Is it Aiden O'Connell's efficiency and poise that he showed in the pocket against the Vikings? Or is it Gardner Minshew being able to move around, manipulate the pocket, and get those big plays? Right. And what it's going to come down to is not turning the ball over as well. We talked about that before, but I look at Minshew, of course, like you said, good downfield plays. O'Connell did well in the red zone, right? Uh, and Minshew did really great in the two minute drill. He's a veteran. He's, he's a wily veteran. So you expect that a little more out of him. So how this thing will go, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to the fans out there to argue back and forth on who it should be. <laughs> I just think that I don't think you're going to have one of these quarterbacks be the starter all, all season, every all, all, all 17 games. I just don't see it. I think it's going to depend on what's happening. Now, maybe Aiden O'Connell goes out and just balls out and he wins it out right and doesn't do it. But he's a quiet dude. There's nothing wrong with that. He's a great young man. But I just think you got to be that guy on the field. I know you're going to give me examples out there of people who were quiet. And then, no, but on the field, they were dogs. And I think that's where Gardner Minshew has the edge. If they're tied, if you will, from a skill perspective and running the offense, I still think that Pierce, because it's early and he's got some time, he'll go with the guy he had last year. But when it comes down to if you start to struggle, 
then what does a coach think, Mo? The average tenure of a coach in the NFL is what? Two and a half years? So Gar he's going to know who's going to give me the best chance to win games. At some point, that becomes more important than loyalty. Absolutely. But like you, I've been saying this from the beginning, too, that I think both quarterbacks are going to start multiple games this year. Yeah. Simply because they're still that close to competition. Like, can you definitively say that Gardner Minshew is the guy? Some Raider fans say, yeah, I can say I, I look at Gardner Minshew in the office just moves a lot better, a lot smoother when he's in the game. And there are some fans that go, well, I like the way Aiden O'Connell is poised in the pocket and he's more efficient. I think the Raiders need that guy who's going to protect yeah. the football and not take too many chances with a good, really good defense on the other side. So it, again, it, it all depends on what the coaching staff sees as the better fit based on where the team is. And I think when you have a good defense, and supposedly there are Raider fans now questioning it because they saw that run defense on Saturday. <laughs> but if you, if you assuming that you think you have a really good defense, you're going to want the quarterback. I hate to say the safe option, but you want the guy who's going to be less prone to turnovers and more efficient. Yes. Yes. And I mean, and I think that's what it comes down to is and the reason that I believe too, that you will see these guys start multiple games all year round or all season long is the fact that it could be a matchup situation, right? You want the more poised guy against one defense and what they have versus another team you're playing. You might want the guy who's going to be a little more freewheeling and that's Gardner Minshew. So it might be matchup situations and no, it's not optimal and that's not how you win a Super Bowl. But I, you know, no one thinks the Raiders are going to the Super Bowl this year, except for a couple of you. And that's fine. And that's all good. <laughs> And I love you for it, Murph. Uh, but the, but other than that, I think you know you you'll see whatever it takes to win, and that's cool. When you're in the position the Raiders are in now, building this roster as they get closer and closer to being a team that can actually make a run like that, then um, you got to do what you got to do. And we kind of knew that coming in, right? Right. And what one point, Scott, that was brought up during my Bleach Report live on Monday, or I believe Saturday after the game, Lawrence the third shot to Lawrence the third. He mm. made a good point. He he raised this this scenario where. If the Raiders' offensive line isn't fully healthy or isn't all there, let's say mm -hmm. Colton Miller, Jack Sparrow Johnson, they don't feel strongly about their left guard position, then you start Gardner Minshew because he's able to kind of compensate for a bad offensive line with his mobility. If your offensive line is at full strength, Colton Miller's back, you have you have confidence in your guard play, then maybe you start eight and O'Connell because he's he's more reliant on having good pass protection on the O-line because he's less mobile. So I think that may also factor into things. I, I didn't think of that until Lawrence III brought it up. That's why I wanted to give him a shout on that one because we saw the Raiders offensive line play on Saturday. It wasn't all that great, especially after the starters. So if Colt Miller's not back, if they don't have a bona fide start at left guard, maybe you do get Gardner Minshew because he's more mobile. Yeah, and, and in the same press conference after the game and actually the day after as well on Monday – Antonio Pierce did say both Colton Miller and Jackson Powers Johnson, who are on the pup list, of course, are expected to return after the upcoming game. So after the Dallas game, right, is when they're supposed to be back. Now, it doesn't mean they'll play in the third preseason game, correct? But they will uh, certainly, uh, if they're back in practice, that would be a huge, huge, huge sign for this Raiders team, for sure. I, I would doubt that Colton Miller plays in that last preseason game, assuming yeah. they're both back. But Jackson Powers Johnson, I think you want to get him out there to get him in some game situations yeah. because he's a rookie and, and missed a lot of the offseason program. Yeah, I mean, look at around the league now, too, guys uh, realizing they need to get just a little time in, like it used to be. Like you saw Patrick Mahomes go out with the mm -hmm. Chiefs and play. I mean, you saw he's the reigning Super Bowl MVP, and he went out and he played, right? I'm not saying he played two quarters, but he played <laughs> a little bit, and he said he wanted to get out there, get hit, the whole deal. So uh, it would be good for him to get out there, especially as a rookie who's missed a lot of time because of injury. So uh, it'll be interesting. But we'll see where this quarterback thing goes. I think clearly this week and how they perform – goes well but I, I i agree with you Mo. i think there's a sense that he's got his mind made up unless something crazy happens and we'll see that uh i'm sure either after the game on sunday or probably more likely he'll tell us on monday after excuse me next saturday after the game and we'll find out there all right we're going to take our first break when we come back here on silver and black today we're going to talk about some of the issues we saw so some of the constructive stuff we got to look at as far as the Raiders are concerned, when it comes to that run defense, when it comes to the defensive backfield, when it comes to the offensive line and depth, we're going to get into that right after this message. You're with Mo, you're with Scott. This is Silver and Black Today. All right, for our video audience, uh, we are, this is where we usually have our uh, Bet US ad, and we're going to do that again, but we're going to do it live with you. That's right. Mo and I, as you can see, we're still on the screen here, but we want to show you, because what we're going to do 
is uh, talk a little bit about our partners over at BetUS. As you guys know, they are a part of Silver and Black today this year. We're really excited to have them. And um, the reason is because, listen, if you're looking to bet on some football this year, and we're going to be able to bet with us, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you want to bet some football this year, bet US fastest payouts in the industry. And not only that, if you use the link below, Mo, you see the link down there, right? You're, you're eyeing that one. You're sending it to your friends, right? <laughs> Definitely right? sent it to a bunch of friends already. Yeah. Okay, good. 125% sign up bonus. Uh, up to $2,000 as well. Uh, and you get, listen, fast and easy deposits, withdrawal process, 24-7 personalized service, 365 days a year, live wagering on all major games. You also get 10% back on your net losses twice a year. For me, that's awesome. Uh, Mo doesn't lose. I lose, but that's okay. So you do that. You can also get your own private personal account manager if you want it. And uh, again, we have this sign-up bonus, 125% up to $2,000 on your first three deposits by using the special silver and black today link down below. And Mo, I'm just popping around the site and I'm looking through this. And again, Mo and I are going to start picking games mm -hmm. later this week, but I love this because you can go in here. If you guys haven't been to bet us, you got to go check it out, but you go in here. Uh, oops. I got to select games here. See, this is all on the fly here. So we can show you what we do, but here we go. We got the games and, and you can bet on all this kind of stuff. And you also have on the right here, the thing about bet us. I love Mo is like, you can bet politics, martial mm -hmm. arts, tennis, you know, the big Cincinnati open is right down the street from me. That's going on right now. I would bet it if I knew anything about tennis, but I don't. <laughs> um, and all this stuff, boxing, you name it. You can do all esports. I can't believe you can bet on people playing video games, but Hey, you can right and entertainment which has to do with movies and all this kind of stuff so when it comes to uh wagering your action this season or whatever you're looking to do you got to check out bet us um where where silver and black today do it and mo are you looking forward to, to kind of going head to head with me because i know you got your bleacher report thing yes and and kelly always likes to make fun of my picks but but we're going to actually have the opportunity to uh to to go against one another with our picks I wanted to say shout out to Raider Head because he gave me crap for some of the bad picks that I made last year. I've been racking up on BetUS, I must say. So nice. Raider Heck, if you you know if you're gonna play some bets, go head over to BetUS for the reason Scott's just just explained, and track my bets, track your bets, track Scott's bets, and let's see how we all do. <laughs> we'll even bring Kelly into the mix. Kelly yes. is is top floor material. That's an inside joke between <laughs> us, but. He, he is a veteran at this, so I'm sure he's already over at BetUS placing some wagers on some baseball games if I had to take a guess. He is. We'll get into that, and we'll, we'll have some fun with this all year round, uh, but we want to send you over to our good friends at BetUS, the best in the business. Again, use the special Silver and Black Today link below in the description, whether you're listening to the podcast or you're listening to us on YouTube or wherever you're watching us, I should say. You can click on that link and get that special deal just from bet us that's bet us uh, our partner here at silver and black today so thank you to them for being a part of the show all right welcome back to silver and black today the tuesday edition scott Colbranson and mo moton back with you we're talking about the raiders 24 23 loss to the minnesota vikings you know how many messages i got mo i can't believe they lost this game in the last second i'm like again don't don't worry about it did the quarterbacks play well what did you see you know i listen fans want to win every game totally get it but i would love to see the raiders go zero and three and then come out of the gate three and oh right i mean to me that's the more important thing i think it was more about how they lost the game we'll <laughs> talk about this we'll talk about timeout gate in, in probably in oh, a few moments yes. but I think it's how the Raiders lost that game and how Antonio Pierce used those timeouts that, that kind of drew people's concern. But we'll get into that later. Yes, we will. And I, and I think that, that that's a great point because um, we, we didn't talk about that. But let's let's talk about the timeout later. But let's talk about first that we talked about the defense. Um, and I want to talk about the run defense first. We touched a little bit on the first segment. But, um, boy, I, I look at that Raider defense against the run, and it was, man, they really got to figure out how to get off blocks better with the run defense you saw the vikings and what they were able to do the vikings overall rushed for 142 yards against the raiders um and and that included 18 by jj mccarthy as well from the quarterback position so so they had some issues there and that really concerned me to your point about you know what are you going to do up there yes christian wilkins was in there 
and Max Crosby and 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 those guys. Uh, but but against the run, were you surprised by that? I, I guess I had some question marks going in, but it did surprise me against that Minnesota team. I just was not expecting it to look as as dire as it did at times. It didn't surprise me for one reason, Scott, and I brought this up after the game over on my Bleach Report live Saturday. I'm going to read you the rankings for Patrick Graham's run defenses mm. as a defensive coordinator uh -oh. for five years. With the Miami Dolphins, his run defense was 27th in yards allowed. With his first year with the Giants, his run defense was 10th, pretty good. Then the following year, it would drop down to 25th. His first year with the Reds, the run defense 19th. And even mm. last year with that pretty good defense, the run defense was 21st. So I'm not trying to pass the blame from the players onto the coach, but I think this is also a Patrick Graham issue where his run defenses, for whatever reason, aren't very good. And I just read you the mm. rankings. That outside of one year when it was top 10 with the Giants, yeah, it's been pretty bad. It's been, you know, second back half of the league in terms of yards allowed. So there's something that he has to tweak with his system. And, of course, Antonio Pierce brought up, you know, the team has a standard – you know, discipline with run lanes and things of that nature. But I think a little bit of it, too, has to go with what can Patrick Graham do to put his guys in better position to stop the run? Yeah, it's a great point, too, because not only did they have trouble getting off the blocks, which to me, I don't know, you know, age, you look at how Antonio Pierce has talked about physicality, pain, all the, the buzzwords, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and I didn't see a lot of physicality up front. I mean, I did in other places, don't get me wrong. So I'm not saying that's an empty promise, but on defense, like I said, just from, especially against the run, it just was not there. I also saw something that scared me last year. And, and luckily Robert Blaine did so well is second level defenders. It, they had trouble too, right? We saw runs extended. We saw plays extended because the second level defenders could not make the play. Now I know Tommy Eichenberg wasn't out there. And some of the, you know, you had um, um, what's his name, Bernie, who did well up front. We talk about him in a minute. Uh, he showed physicality and improvement, especially I think in zone coverage. But when you look at those things up front, not being able to get off blocks, coupled with the second level not being able to 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 pursue and to be where they should be, that's what created a lot of the issues. Right, so Sam Darnold looked pretty sharp when his drop, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and yes, Jack Jones had that interception on J.J. McCarthy. I'm not too worried about the third, fourth strings that J.J. McCarthy went up against. A lot of those guys are not going to make the roster. But as far as the defense is concerned, I, I don't think it was up to standard. And I think Antonio Pierce mentioned it after the game that we have a standard. Yeah. And the Raiders, specifically on the defensive side of the ball, didn't play up to that standard. So I think you'll see a more spirited defense when they go up against the Cowboys. But I, I'm not worried about the pass rush because I expect Max Crosby and Malcolm Coons to be ready to go during the regular season. Christian Wilkins on the inside. I'm more worried about the Raiders being able to patch up those holes on the interior because right. if they're not able to do that and teams, you know, teams key in on that, have two running backs who can who can go downhill, that could be a problem. Because again, with Patrick Graham's run defenses, it's been a perpetual issue. This isn't just a one-off thing. We can say, ah, oh, it's just a preseason. No, I just read you the rankings. Patrick Graham's run defenses haven't been very good going back to this time in Miami. So something there has to change. I think one of the things they can tweak is maybe get Marcon McCall involved. He's a 345-pound nose tackle. The, <clears throat> the Raiders probably miss a lot of Jonathan Jink uh, Jonathan Hankins. Uh, if you remember Jonathan Hankins, he was their, he was their top run stopper, and they yeah. sent him to the Cowboys – you know, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, but the Raiders need to beef up their, their run defense. They, I think they need a big guy, another big guy in there who's going to be able to stop the run because thus far, Byron Young, their third rounder from last year, who's supposed to be a good run defender coming out of Bama, hasn't left his mark on this team yet. Right, right. And I think that you, you look at the situation with what they were doing, and I talked about that second level, and you did see some, like I talked about Amari Bernie. You and I were texting about him uh, right after the game, as a matter of fact, because we were so impressed with what he did, especially, uh, I thought, playing in zone coverage. He was way improved. And he's a guy you and I have both liked since the beginning, since they took him out of Florida. And, and it seems like, okay, so that was, to me, very encouraging. And then on the back end, Amari Gaynor, um, I thought, did pretty well. He surprised me. I mean, he's very physical. Uh, but I do think that um, this defense, you're right, I think, it's about adjustments, right? So I'm not freaking out about it, nor nor should you out there. It's a concern, but if they come in and they play tight against the Cowboys and we see better play out of them, then I won't be as concerned. Are you, you there with me? 
I'm there with you, but as a GM, if you're Tom Telesco, you have to be able to see problems before they happen, right? True. So true. My my perspective on this is you sign a Dory Jackson now. You hope that he doesn't have to start. But like I said, Nate Hobbs has missed double digit games over the last two years. So it, you know, you don't you don't want a player to get hurt, but you know injuries happen, right? So if one of those starters goes down, are you confident that the Cameron Richardson can right away be plugged in there and start and play well, or NJ Devonshire or Sam Webb? So far, I would say no. So you go out yeah. and get your veteran insurance right now and address the problem before it becomes an even bigger issue. So Dory Jackson's still out there. Tom Telesco, pick up the phone, call Dory Jackson. He has some experience in Patrick Graham's system. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's definitely something they should do. And we've been talking about that all offseason, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with getting help, especially yeah. a lot of those guys. You get them on their non-guaranteed deals. At the worst, maybe you got to guarantee them a year. But, you know, I don't think you're going to get worse by having somebody like that. Uh, on on the line so um it's interesting now let's talk about the defensive backfield well that was the other thing because um front line of course we saw you'd mentioned jack jones ball hawk did well i saw jacory and bennett i thought play really well i thought nate hobbs played really well so that the starting three at cornerback no problems i thought they did pretty well uh yeah. when when you look at some of the other points though you saw some breakdowns on the back end, especially later on when you had Webb and and actually both safeties, I thought struggled at times. Uh, I thought they were they were very they were caught off guard. I saw them to me they were cheating in the backfield too much, looking towards that direction and not finding where the receiver was in in the play in the zone. And so that breakdown in zone, but also well, zone was better. You saw more breakdown in man to man, but zone was better. But I just thought that. It was a little bit of being slow and a little bit of not recognizing what they were seeing. I feel like Trayvon Merrick was okay. Yeah. I, I never saw Marcus Epps as a, as a playmaking safety, but I thought Trayvon Merrick was okay. I believe he had six tackles in the first quarter. So he was all at least he first was, half he was active running. and all over the field. Yeah, uh, when he was out there. So I, I I don't have any worries about Trayvon Merrick, but we did get to see a lot of Chris Smith the second on the field. He did get a lot of snaps. So you're hoping that. You know the depth there because Marcus Epps is not your long-term starter there. You know, yeah. probably after next year they move on and have another guy starting next to Trayvon Merrick if he's back because Trayvon Merrick's on an expiring contract, going to be a free agent in 2025. I, I want to see, I want to see more of Isaiah Polamau. I talked about him on the yeah. last show. I, I think he could be someone who can really boom in that defense if he could just get more time on the playing field. So I hope we get to see a little more of him. And I hope we get continue to see more of Chris Smith II because the Raiders actually moved up for him when they drafted him in the fifth round. Now, that was the previous regime under Dave Ziegler, but I think Chris Smith could be a playmaker, but he just doesn't have a lot of experience. Did really play last year. I, I, this is the time where he can kind of get his experience in live game situ uh, live game situations. Yeah, and we did see uh, Trey Taylor, of course, my my guy yep. that I like out of Air Force. He had two solo tackles. Um, didn't really shine, didn't really choke. You know, he was just kind of out there, had a couple snaps. He was limited, uh, but it was good to see him at least get out there, which shows, you know, if you see a rookie that drafted that late, that's not out there at all, then you can, you're concerned that they're not really going to be part of that, but at least he got some, some time in there. But I do think too, to your point about a Dory Jackson is, you, you know, <laughs> if I'm Tom Telesco, yeah, I'm looking probably for two bodies just in case, because, you're going to have to have the depth because guys get banged up. You, very rarely do you go through a year where you're going to have all three corners and both safeties on every, you're just not going to have it. You're going to have to, depending on the, obviously the play call too, but, but I just think that they're going to have to do that. And um, it'll be interesting to see if they pull that trigger, if they do this week, Mo, or if they wait and see after Dallas again uh, and see what happens. As I said, Scott, Nate Hobbs has missed 10 games over the last two years. He missed six in 2022, and he missed four in 2023. He's not, while a lot of people like Nate Hobbs, he isn't exactly Iron Man back there. So Correct. You let go. You let Tyler Hall walk. He signs with the Eagles. You let Amik Robertson walk. He signs with the Detroit Lions. You lose some of that veteran depth. Who's going to step up? Who's going to be that next guy off the bench in the secondary? Maybe someone pops in the second preseason game against the Dallas Cowboys, but again – I think you have to be proactive with seeing some problems before they become real big issues. Yeah. And um, let's, before we get to the break and then get to the Raider Nation mailbag for this show, let's talk about the timeouts at the end okay. of the game. Um, so the Raiders get in a situation where they, they basically gave the game to the, the Vikings because of the, the timeout situation. 
And he was asked about it sort of uh, at the press conference. And he just says, hey, well, I think it's just all of us when he asked about, you know, game situations. Where do you find things? Where do you learn from these things? And he he said that he mentioned Matt Sheldon, who helps out with game management situation. Uh, and, and they need to go back and evaluate it. But this is, this is what I was, this is what I said going back several months and I expect it. So it's not, it's not surprising. And it, thank goodness it's a preseason game, right? But first time, full-time head coach, right? You got some, you got a new staff together. Not everybody's the same, especially obviously on offense, you got a bunch of new guys. Uh, and so you're going to have these things kind of until they get to learn the system and communicate with one another that's what you deal with with this situation with a new coaching staff. It happens with experienced coaches too. So I'm not saying it's just Antonio Pierce. It happens all over the place. But but I wouldn't get too concerned about it if it continues to happen in the next two games. Then maybe get some concerned about it. But I think they got time to iron the thing out. Scott, you know me. I'm all about consistency and trends, right? Yes. So if if this continues to be a problem, we have another issue like this or similar to it. Then you're thinking, you know, what's going on? Because remember, Antonio Pierce is. Surrounded by experienced head coaches. I believe Tom yeah. Coughlin has been at his practices. Marvin Lewis is around. You know, Philbin, Joe Philbin is around. And I think the, the alarming thing wasn't that an ex- inexperienced head coach botched that situation that you see play out a thousand times every season. Yeah. But it's the fact that no one said anything and, and kind of intervened and said, hey, what are you doing, A.B.? You know, this is not you don't want to give the Vikings more time because just to paint the context, just to paint the picture, the Vikings are driving down the field. They run out of timeouts. It's third down and and the Raiders call a timeout. And I remember seeing I'm like, why do the Raiders call a timeout? (laughs) Even the broadcasters are saying Vegas is doing us a favor. Yeah. You remember you have your you have the Vikings third four stringers out there. You already blocked the field goal earlier in the game in the first half. You don't want to give the team time to set up their offense and score now again i don't i'm not making a big deal of this because it's the preseason better happen now than week one or in the regular season anytime but i i think it's something to to pay attention to because it then as i said i'm a consistency and trends guy if it comes a perpetual problem going into the season then you're wondering who on that staff is speaking up to ap when they think he's wrong and then his approach or his methods in doing anything on that sideline it's important that's where when you are an assistant coach on a team uh, yes, the head coach is the CEO. He's the boss, but you got to speak up if it's going to hurt the team, or if you notice something, it's your responsibility to speak up. And that's what you have to empower your coaches to do. So hopefully they feel that they find that and they gel that together. And he said, look, we got to sit down and we got to, we all, we all own it. And he's right. They all do own it to your point. So I, I think they'll work it out and we'll see how things go down in Dallas. Okay. You got one more thing. And really quick, that's what yeah. I was going to say is that at least he got up there and he owned it. Yes. He asked him about it. He said, lesson learned. Yes. So he's taking accountability for it. He wasn't like the previous coach who kind of, <laughs> you know, pushed Blame accountability others. away. Yeah. Antonio Pierce owned that. And he said, look, that lesson learned, it won't happen again. No, he's that kind of guy. Absolutely. We all know that about Antonio Pierce. So that's good. Okay. We're going to take our final break here on the Tuesday edition of Silver and Black today. When we come back, it's time for you. It's time for your calls, your text messages on the Raider Nation mailbag if you want to get in on thursday's show something mo and i said bugged you or you agreed with us or you just want to call and tell us how great we are you could do that too 702-900-7869 that's 702-900-7869 silver and black today and odyssey sports radio podcast also heard on 1015 fmk dawn in las vegas as well as 98.5 the bet if i can get it out all right we'll be back right after this Michael Vick at BetUS.com. Catch an incredible 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits plus 10% gambler's insurance. BetUS, my online sports book and casino. All right. Welcome back, Silver and Black, today. Time for the Raider Nation mailbag. For those of you watching us, you just saw me bobbling my Tony Gwynn bobblehead for the Padres, the hottest team in baseball since the All-Star break. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly Kreiner. Yes. Well, you're a Mets fan, right? Absolutely. Born yeah. the year they won the World Series, so I'm 80, good luck 86. to the Mets. 86. I got to start going to more games. Maybe they'll win. Oh, yes. We'll see. <laughs> Bill Buckner. Yes, I remember. I actually watched it. Ah, look at that. You weren't born until after that, though. Actually, I was born before. because if Right um, before. April, yeah, right? Born in April, so. That's right. 
So I was about eight months early old, that season, old. you're yeah. the reason they won. You were exactly. the good luck charm. Exactly. So most Redomus's most Redomus's first prediction. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. All right. There you go. There you go. Okay. If you want to be a part of the show, 702-900-7869 is the number. 702-900-7869. You can text us there or you can leave a voicemail. Try to be pithy. We get some great messages, but some people get cut off because you're going like three minutes. Try to get it like a minute and a half or below just so we can make sure we get your whole call on. Uh, you could do that or you could text us if you're shy. Also, you can mail us at uh, mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. I have a feeling it's going to be a lot about the games, Mo. We'll see. Scott, Scott I was going to say, if people yes. want to leave long romantic messages about the Raiders, we should just give them our direct <laughs> phone number so then they can leave their long messages and they won't have to get cut off. Only if it's like Barry White, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I need a softer voice in my More. voice. Now, if you're going to call me. If you're going to call me about the Raiders at 2 a.m., it, yeah. look, it's got to no be deep voices. It, I need. No. Soft feminine voices if you're gonna call Hi, me Mo. about <laughs> Mo, it's it's Mo. Hi Mo. Okay, no. It's okay. Cynthia. It's Cynthia. <laughs> it's Monique. We can be Monique and Mo. We can have our own show. Okay. Oh sorry. my gosh. All right. No, enough of that. Okay. <laughs> so we're gonna get to your calls. First up, and I think he hasn't called in like a couple months. I remember him calling before months. though. I'm starting to memorize people who call in. This is Jesse. From the great state of Arizona, forks up, go Devils. Here we go. <laughs> There's a bunch of people saying that Aiden O'Connell, or I'm sorry, Gardner Minshew is definitely QB number one. And I just want to pump the brakes on that because he they both had a good outing. And just because Minshew had the touchdown, I mean, he didn't really had limited snaps. Um, or I'm sorry, that, that he really just had one drive. And it was pretty pretty good. I mean, seven or nine for 70-some yards. And he could have had the touchdown had Andres Pete not missed that <laughs> that uh, block on the sack. So I think he, he played well. And, and he showed – some control there. I really like that part. Yeah, it's not exciting. It's not, um, but he's got pocket awareness, man. I don't, you know, and I'm like I said, whoever wins the job, hey, I'll root for them all the way. But I just think people need to slow down on making Colin Minshew the undisputed QB one at this moment because I, I I didn't see that. <laughs> Anyways, let me know your thoughts. All right, Raiders. <laughs> all right, Jesse out in Arizona. And Mo, it goes back to what we talked about the first segment, but but I, I agree with them. I don't think either one of them, it was good that they both did well, but but neither one of them separated themselves so much that you're like, oh my gosh, it's clear who is the starting quarterback here because of X, Y, and Z. Numbers, like you said, uh, uh, O'Connell, again, and I kind of brain farted on this and people corrected me online, which was great, which is, I was like, I wonder why he didn't play more. Well, he played the whole first quarter. They just didn't have the ball much. But when he had the ball, 7 to 9, 78% or 78% completion percentage, 76 yards, average of 8.4, uh, and and along a 24. So he did well when he was in there. He was very efficient. And then Minshew, of course, had more snaps, 12 snaps, excuse me, 12 attempts, not snaps, 117 yards, 50% completion rations, average of 9.8 yards with the one touchdown. So you know, none of those blow you away and says, well, clearly they're head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah, I don't think either player separated themselves. So mm. whatever thought they had about the quarterback position coming into this, now, you, of course, you got one more game of film to look at, but I don't think it really changed anything significantly. I, I Look, if you're going to just look at the box score numbers, then you say, yeah, Garner Minshew's a start. He had more passing yards. He had the touchdown drive. They both played a quarter. But Aiden O'Connell only got one drive, one long drive. That's how it played out, right? So if you're looking at it and you say Aiden O'Connell's play, he was poised in the pocket. Again, manipulating the pocket is not just being able to just scurry around, scramble around, and, and make a play on the move. It's about stepping up, realizing you do have a clean pocket. You don't need to step out of the pocket. Just step up and make the throw. And yeah. I think Aiden O'Connell did a good job of doing that. And that's where the efficiency comes in. Whereas Gardner Minshew, you're going to get the wow plays. But as a lot of film people pointed out over the past weekend, there were times where he 
he could have just stepped up in the pocket and made a play rather than move outside the pocket, extend the play, draw pressure, get his tight end, Harrison Bryant, popped by a Vikings defender. You know, there there are times where regarding Minshew could have been a little more efficient and slick and and just maybe try to do too much on certain plays, whereas Aiden O'Connor was like, you know, poised pocket, presence, deliver the football accurately, next play. Whereas Gar Gardner Minshew, you're going to get the wild stuff, but sometimes you just don't need it. Yeah, and it reminds me a little bit, if I, if, if Raider Nation, if you'll forgive me uh, for this, not really a criticism, I'm just going to point it out to you, and you, you might not like it, but it reminds me a lot of when we saw flashes of Marcus Mariota, right? Because Raider fans are not used to that. They're not used to that player that moves out and 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 kind of creates on the run and that kind of stuff. And and there's danger in that too. To your point, I think there's there's a safety. Well, there's a a, a different approach with Aiden O'Connell than there is with Minshew. And so his is very risky, but it's high risk, high reward. Where O'Connell is a little bit lower than that, right? So you don't you don't risk as much. And yeah, he can still pop a long bomb. We saw it last year but it's very different. So when you're watching it as a fan, like for me watching it, yeah, Minshew was more fun to watch, just plain and simple. Not that he deserves a job, but I'm just saying he was more fun to watch. So I understand the response to them, Jesse. Yes, if people are overreacting and say, oh, he's clearly a starter, I don't agree with that, but I do understand the excitement. Does that make sense, Mo? Yeah. You know, the guy that – that it's one of those situations where, you know, you're, you have two dating candidates. One is exciting. <laughs> He's the he or she is the thrill, takes your places, you know. It, it may you may be in some danger, you know. You never know what's gonna happen. Yeah. And the other dating candidate is just kind of boring, you know. He takes you out to the restaurant, you eat, get you back home at a good time, you watch TV maybe, and that's it. You know, it's it's like it's kind of like, do you want the thrill with the with the danger involved, or do you want the you know what you're gonna get, you know where you're gonna be. And the consistency, because I think still to this point, Aiden O'Connell has the edge when it comes to being consistent, same player yes. drive the drive. Whereas Garner Minshew is like, yeah, we like we we like the big plays, Garner. We like the fact that you're mobile, but just rein it in a little bit. But you don't you want him to be himself, so he can only rein it in, but so much without being Garner Minshew. You want Garner Minshew to be Garner Minshew because that's what gives him an edge over Aiden O'Connell when it comes to those big plays. So it's going to come down to again. I go back to saying this: What do the Raiders want? They didn't right. want to poise pure pocket passer who's going to be more consistent, efficient from the pocket, or do they want to take more shots with the big plays downfield with Devontae Adams and a lot of their playmakers? And as I said earlier, I think this year it's going to depend on who they're playing. <laughs> but I will say this, in an old reference to when I was young and dumb, now I'm old and dumb, but when I was young and dumb, <laughs> we used to call that, you know, that, that girl, we called her a moped. Right. Oh gosh, here we go, Scott. You're gonna get some trouble. No, we're not gonna get in trouble. But anyway, we're getting back. Jesse, thank you for your call. <laughs> now we go all the way from the desert, the Sonoran Desert, out in Arizona. Yes, I know my geography. Shame on you for you if you don't. We're going to the swamps. We're going to Everglades. We're going to South Florida for South Full Raider. I think is his name. I couldn't quite understand it. Tell me if it's my old ears, Mo. If you can understand it better. But here is our man down in Florida. Hey, what's up, Scott? What's up, Mo? Uh, this is South Full Full Raider. Uh, down in Miami. I'm a first time caller, always listening to the show. In regards to the quarterback battle, I believe Minshew will ultimately win this job. Mm. Uh, Getsky runs an air raid style offense, which Minshew has experience with in college. He ran it under Mike Leach. Uh, I think this offense requires some mobility. It would be great if Adian would win it, but um, I mean, I think that he has the legs up. I think Minshew has the legs up on this one. Um, some other points I want to bring out Minshew. Uh, has won pretty much with nothing throughout his careers. Uh, you could argue that he could have made the playoffs last year uh, had he started all the games for the Colts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, he, he's going to have so many more weapons at his, disposable, uh, his disposal here. He's going to have Bowers. He's going to have Adams. He's going to have Myers. Um, anyways, love everything that you guys discussed, man. Uh, this is South Florida Raider out. South Florida Raider. Okay, stay, man. I appreciate it. Down in Miami. Give me some Cuban food. Send up a Cuban sandwich as soon as you can. I appreciate that. Uh, but thanks for the call, your first call. Call in again, man. We appreciate that very much. And he makes some good points there about the offense. We talked about, we praised what Luke Getze did in the offense. I thought not only the play calling was good, 
but you talked about also Brock Bowers being you. Brock Bowers played at fullback three times, by the way, by my count. I could be wrong. Could have been less or more, but it was, I think, three. So you saw him lined up. We talked about that all summer too, didn't we? But I think that um, his point about Minshew knowing that offense, yeah, he's comfortable in it. Is it enough to make him the starter? It's going to come down to to what Antonio Pierce wants, what Luke Getze wants. Uh, but you know at least he's got so much experience running it that if you do go to Minshew at any point, whether it's starting or in relief, he's going to be able to get in there, know what he's got to do, and start to move the offense. That's Pro Bowl quarterback Garner mentioned to you all listening out there, <laughs> by the way. No, but uh, South Florida Raider makes some good points. Uh, I, I was a big Garner Minshew guy before the Raiders signed him. I remember having a tweet back in 2020, 2021, and I said, Garner Minshew just needs an opportunity. I think he could be a, a serviceable starting quarterback in his league. I still believe that. Now, you talked about this in the first segment about the timeline with mm -hmm. Antonio Pierce. Antonio Pierce is in his first year as a head coach, right? I believe that's a two-year deal, though. But he he has some he has some time. So if you're Antonio Pierce and you go, okay, Garner Minshew has played well as a spot starter, as a starter early in his career at the Jacksonville Jaguars. We know he can run the offense. He's a veteran. He can handle it. But I'm curious as to what Aiden O'Connell could be if he has some growth. Could he be better than Garner Minshew, even though he doesn't have Garner Minshew's mobility? And I think that's the intriguing factor here mm. is you want to tap into that upside if Aiden O'Connell has it we don't know how much upside Aiden O'Connell has because you only find out if he's playing <laughs> and I think that that goes to your point that you just mentioned Scott that if you throw Aiden O'Connell out there he stinks the first four or five weeks you can always go to Gardner Minshew right so it, it, it's it's not like okay we're gonna throw Aiden O'Connell out there and we're gonna roll with him for the rest of the season I think you understand what you have in Gardner Minshew you go okay if we need to throw out Gardner Minshew at any point we can do that if Aiden O'Connell doesn't have as much upside, okay, we'll, we understand that. He's a backup. Gardner Minshew, it's your offense for the rest of the season. But I think that that intrigue of how much upside does Aiden O'Connell have is also going to factor into this. I know it's it's about the best man winning the job, but you also got to understand a lot of other factors play into, the, play into this. Sometimes it's not locker room politics. Sometimes it's you want upside. And that's we talk when we talk about the draft, right? When draft comes around, we go, okay, this guy has a higher ceiling, so teams are going to take a, take a chance with this guy picking him in the top 10 over a guy who has a possibly a lower ceiling. I think you can apply that same thing here where Aiden O'Connell and Garner Minshew, as long as there's not a big of a difference between the two quarterbacks, yeah, you can throw either one of them out there and then have the backup come in at any time. Yeah, and it also comes down to, if I look at the schedule too, Mo, to me – I, and I know we'll get into more of a prediction as we get after we get through the preseason, but uh, at least revised. You already made an initial one, but you look at weeks one and two at LA against the Chargers, who I just don't think are going to be a very good football team. I, I don't think you can you can underestimate them too much because I, I as much as Raider fans don't like Justin Herbert, I think he's a good quarterback, and I think Jim Harbaugh is a good coach, so he'll get I think the most out of what he can get up. But they've had so much changes, I just don't think they're going to be a very good football team. That's my opinion. But then you play the Ravens. So you got to start one and one. But if you could start two and those are two AFC games, by the way. You have one in division and one obviously out of division, but still AFC. If you're thinking about the playoffs down the line, and of course you got week three at home against the Carolina Panthers, which is a great one for them. But you know, if I look at that, I want to know, hey man, you're right. He's got time, but at the same time, if I want to get off on a quick start here and, and start to be make noise in the AFC about being a playoff team. I want to start fast too. So that's, but that's what he gets paid the bucks for. He's going to have to decide, you know, what he's going to do there and which approach he wants to take. And either one of them can work, but uh, we'll see how it all works out. But uh, South Florida third Raider, thank you so much for that one as we move on. All right. We're going to get to our buddy Tarek in Chicago. And it's been a couple of weeks since he's been on the show, but here's Tarek. Good evening, Scott and Mo. This is Tarek checking in with you guys from Chicago. Hope you gentlemen are well. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about uh, the first preseason game. I thought a AOC and Minshew did some pretty good things. Uh, they both showed some poise, um, uh, were able to extend plays, and were pretty accurate with the football. Uh, so that's definitely encouraging, and uh, we definitely got to see how they do in week two as they continue to progress. Anthony Brown looked horrible. My goodness. I mean, he looked completely un uncomfortable, and like he just – he was just terrible in every aspect. So I think hopefully we just might go with these two quarterbacks on our roster, which are AOC and Minshew. I think Trey Tucker looked good. 
solid for sure. Jacoby Meyer looked really good. Uh, Brock Bowers looked fantastic. Again, this was without Devontae Adams. I think our initial run defense was suspect. Um, I also didn't like some of the things with our red zone offense. I mean, we, you know, we're just known for settling for field goals too often in the red zone. So hopefully we clean that up. And again, not uh, having too much of a reaction from it. It's uh, definitely a lot to digest for their staff. Uh, Jack Jones had a beautiful interception. Um, um, and, and one thing toward the end of the game, like, I mean, the Raiders are just too often on the wrong side of those type of finishes. Like, put the game away. You had multiple opportunities to put the game away at the end. Uh, I don't understand the timeouts by Antonio Pierce when the Vikings had the ball. Like, that made absolutely no sense to me. And he really wasn't asked about that at the presser. He just kept getting, getting the ball to Sincere McCormick. He kept getting stuffed. And you just kept punting the ball back. It made no sense to me at all. And uh, does anybody know what's going on with Tommy Eichenberg? Um, somebody mm-hmm. said he's dealing with some personal stuff. I haven't heard anything about that. So if you guys could shed some light on that, that'd be great. Um, but on to the Cowboys. Um, hopefully, um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of the uh, the uh, game yourself, you guys. So have a great week. And I look forward to your next show. And I'll talk to you guys again very soon. Go Raiders. Bye-bye. Uh-huh. All right, there's our buddy Tarek. Thanks for the call, man. Yeah, on Tommy Eichenberg, that one surprised me before the game that he wasn't active. I, I, There's been no stories. There was no questions asked about it. There's been – oh, you got something? I missed it then. Go ahead. Antonio Pierce, I believe it was Sunday was asked about it. He really quickly said he's dealing with some stuff. He didn't okay. get into detail. He, he just said he's yeah. dealing with some stuff. Okay, so, so that's I, what Tarek I, was talking about. Yeah, so that's what Tarek was alluding to. But Tarek, I just want to say Tarek always has a very detailed call. Like he, he always. Like Tarek, Tarek's calls sound like – written articles almost <laughs> like he could literally sit down i don't know what he does for a living but he could sit down and write an article from some of the calls that he has is always they're always very detailed but I, I wanted to touch on the, the timeout situation and again i i'm not overreacting to what what's happened in the preseason no. you know you kind of expect inexperienced head coaches to have these brain fart moments but i, I think the bigger thing here is no other coach said anything. I think that's what's alarming a lot of Raider fans, at least from my timeline. A lot of Raider fans reached out to me and said, it's not the fact that an inexperienced head coach botched the situation that happens, even with some experienced coaches. It's the fact that no one spoke up to intervene and say something about the situation where, okay, you don't want to call timeouts in this situation. Also want to mention the sincere McCormick getting stuffed and, and Anthony Brown. I'm not as hard on Anthony Brown Jr. as a lot of other Raider fans because if you look at the offensive line, Anthony Brown was behind. <laughs> Anthony Brown played the entire second half of that game, and he threw three passes. He attempted yeah. three passes. That tells you that Luke Getzey either didn't trust Anthony Brown Jr., didn't trust the offensive line, or tr- trusted neither in that situation. He had a whole half, and he threw the ball three times. That yes. tells you that tells you what Luke Getzey thought about that second half offense. So it's hard to judge Anthony Brown behind when he was playing with but that offensive line, we talked about the offensive line depth, could be a problem if the if some of the backup guys, two guys, but, have to start if Colt Miller and JPJ aren't back yet. But, Mo, Anthony Brown could be a franchise quarterback. Yeah, we had a lot of people ask us about Anthony Brown. That Listen, everybody start. likes the quarterback who never plays because they never make mistakes. Um, but but no, I agree with you on that. I mean, it was like playing playing behind the offensive line of a, a senior center flag football team, right? You just didn't have talent out there. Right. And you didn't know what was going on, so so I don't I don't look at that too much, but I mean the defense. He talked about the run defense a little bit. I mean, look at the Raiders. The Raiders gave up 142 yards rushing. They gave up 310 passing, most of that in the second half. By the way, right? We saw that um, uh, happen with JJ McCarthy, who had a who had a good day for the for the Vikings, and a lot of that came at the expense of the Raiders uh, back end. Uh, and as I talked about the 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 second the second tier of that defense as well. So they're going to have to tighten that up. But, you know, it's preseason. You see it. See what happens. Uh, and the offensive line, too. We talked about depth there. Hopefully they get healthy and get Jackson Powers Johnson out there because the Vikings didn't blitz or anything. It wasn't like the Vikings were running their number one defense. Everybody runs the same kind of stuff. So we'll see. But Tarek is always a great call. So we appreciate that. I'm going to read a text now. If I can find it. I got too many screens open. It's confusing me now. Uh, let me find it. But um, if you, by the way, if you want to call in and be part of the um the show make sure you call in 702-900-7869 that's 702-900-7869 leave your name and where you're calling from we need to know who you are and then um leave your message and and you know make it as quick as you can without without hurry hurrying all right our text is from our man chavi 24 up in the bay area 
been a while since he reached out, he says. He says, it's time to see if Luke Getze can help any of our QBs run a decent offense. After watching the first preseason game, I was fine with the offense. I wanted to see a little more from the defense, but starters played one series. I also wanted to see certain players do well. Was glad to see Trey catch some deep passes and Brock get involved. I wanted Tyree to succeed with the second team, but didn't see much. Just wanted to get your thoughts on the offense and defense. No need to overreact. It's the first preseason game. That's Chavi 24 up in the Bay Area, and I agree with you on your last statement there. Let's talk about that. So Tyree, Will Tyree Wilson um, with the second team, Mo, uh, not a lot of noise there. Okay, so I want to say this first because I know people are going to say, you're writing him off. You're you're too quick to call him a bust. I'm not calling <laughs> Tyree game. Wilson a bust. I'm not writing off Tyree Wilson. All I'm saying is this is another situation. This is another, this is another moment where I could say, I think we need to start lowering our expectations of Ty Wilson in the go. second year. He's already not go. a starter. He's already behind Max Crosby and Malcolm Koontz on the edge. Even if you move him inside, he's not going to get as many snaps as Christian Wilkins or Adam Butler or John Jenkins. Adam Butler came out and said that Ty Wilson is taking baby steps. You watch that preseason game against the Vikings. He was just the guy out there. Did not stand out. He's fully healthy. So this isn't like last year when he was coming off of a surgery. He's mm -hmm. fully healthy. So you can't say uh, he's hurt. He's banged up from, from what we know. Fully healthy guy this year going into his second year, and he's still not making those big strides. Now, I'm not saying he has to go out there and be a star, but the fact that he's not showing up in the preseason, you, you're hearing about him struggling at practices, still getting off the ball. It's concerning. Again, I'm not writing him off. I'm not saying he's not going to be any good. I'm not saying he's not going to make any impact. That was Vic Tafer who wrote that, by the way. Uh, I just feel <laughs> like whatever your expectations were before coming into this offseason, you may have to lower those a bit because, you know, I think he'll get on the field. But at this point, you're thinking, will Janarius Robinson steal some snaps from Tyree Wilson on the edge? Will the Raiders sign a veteran edge rusher to, to spruce up the pass rush behind Max Crosby and Malcolm Koontz if they lose some confidence in Tyree Wilson making plays with consistency? I, I think you don't rule those things out. So, again, yeah. if the Raiders sign a veteran edge rusher, I think that's a direct shot at, at Tyree Wilson that maybe you know they've lowered their expectations. But I've already lowered my expectations of Tyree Wilson going to his second year. Now, if he surprises me and has eight sacks and 25 pressures, great. But what I, all I'm saying is, yeah, all I'm saying is don't expect those numbers based on where he is on the depth chart and based on what we've seen in the preseason and what we've heard from, from the practices. Yep, absolutely. All right. Good call, Tariq, as, uh, Tarek, as always. Uh, and now we'll end the show, or this segment, with our final call, and that is a guy we haven't heard from in a couple weeks either because we've gotten so many calls, we can't just get to them all. It is our good buddy, Humo. Jacob yes. from Fresno. Jacob from Fresno. Here we go. Get Jelly Jelly Gel Princing and Mini 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 Town Mo Motin. This is Jacob from Fresno. What's up, guys? Uh, yeah, so let's recap that game a little bit, shall we? Um, quarterbacks, I think they really overachieved in that game in terms of what we had expectation wise. I, I think that it's you know, it's preseason. It's not the best indicator of where we're really at, but it's encouraging to see that Gardner and Aiden did not have the same struggles that they had against our defense. Now, Aiden looked good. Gardner looked even better. But <laughs> I'll say that Gardner, you know, he had three possessions where Aiden had one because yes, sir. the way it played out in the first quarter, just long time of possession on that first drive, and then defense, you know, the, the, the other offense had the ball – for a long time. Regardless, they both looked good. Uh, Gardner did more. You know, he had more opportunities. We, we saw a touchdown with Zeus. We saw Gardner throw a really nice touchdown. We saw a field goal, and we saw a field goal with Aiden O'Connell, of course. But here's the thing, guys. And I told you, let me just pop this one in. Walk me off the ledge, guys, because I am ready to get hurt again with Jack Jones. I just believe this guy's going to be an all-pro, going to be great. And everything I see just keeps reinforcing that. So please, just help me. Pull me back. Give me something. But anyway, back to the quarterback. <laughs> I think it's still a very even competition. And other people might think differently because mm -hmm. Gardner looks so good. But we didn't get to see very much of Aiden. You know? And what we did see was good. And the one play where it kind of messed everything up was right at the end where Andrews Pete, our backup tackle, right? That's what he is right now. Uh, 
he is the one that let the rookie come through and wreck that third down. And who knows what would have happened. But then again, Aiden seems to be a liability with the feet. I still don't know that Gardner would have been able to do anything on that play because it was just such a blown so up fast. play and he got beat so badly. Yep. Uh, what do you guys think? What, do you uh, do you have the same opinion as me? Do you think it's very even, or do you think no Gardner is the guy? We're going with guard dog. What do you guys think? Uh, again, give me something with Jack Jones, man, because I, like I said, I'm ready to get hurt again. I am just believing. <laughs> I'm in my believies. All right, you guys, take it easy. Go Raiders. All right, there is Jack up from Fresno. Okay, sorry, Jacob. I had to give him some voice. I'm just messing Jacob, around. Now. Jacob's awesome. He's, I, look, Jacob's he, always awesome. He and that's why, I like sometimes when not sometimes, that's like when he raps with the show because he, you know, yes. he has he has his he has his opening, his introduction, right. and then he gets into it. Like he he, he performs. Really, he really brought it. So he has some some Absolutely. predictions, and I'll, I'll get into his prediction with Jack Jones because I think that stood out to me first. And I, yeah, I, I'm not gonna talk you off the ledge, Jacob. I, I think I think Jack Jones is the real deal. Again, there were some people who call into our show asking, is he really a cornerback one? I, with Jack Jones, it was never about his performance on the field. He had some issues away from the field during his collegiate years. And that's why he, I believe he went in the middle rounds of fourth round, I believe, to the Patriots. If not for those off-field issues, he probably would have been a, a day two pick, you know, at maybe a, a late day one pick. But I, Jack Jones has the talent. You can clearly see he studies film. You, and he has the athleticism. When you put those two things together, you have star potential. Now, could he be an all pro? We'll see. I think at least a pro bowler if he continues to pick off passes at, at this rate. Uh, he mentioned Andrews Pete, and I said this on my Bleacher mm -hmm. Report Live that Andrews Pete, in my opinion, he's a better backup left guard than he is a backup left tackle. I know he played well left tackle last year against the Saints, but most of his tenure career, he's been a guard. So I, I think, assuming, hoping that Colt Miller is back, Andrews Pete goes back to playing guard and not, and not left tackle. The other thing I want to bring up about that play is. In addition to Andrews Peake giving up the sack, and the film guys pointed this out too, that if you look on the other side of the field, you see two receivers basically run into each other. And when you see two receivers in the same area, that's not a good sign. Someone ran the wrong route. Or there was a miscommunication. So that play, and that the entirety of that play, which is a bad play, all to, from, from the sack to the receiver routes, it, it just wasn't a good red zone call. I think it was Tarek who said he was worried about the red zone offense. So some of that is 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 not just on Aiden taking the sack or Andrew Speed giving up the sack, but just the design of the play was just completely off. Yeah, and and listen, I, like like we said earlier too, Mo. I think for this is the first time they've run this offense live, right? They didn't have joint practices with any teams this year, so I expected some messiness, right? Yeah. And, um, but, and I agree with you on Jack Jones. I have nothing else to say about it. Cause I think I, it's never been a problem with his abilities at all. And so now with him there with Antonio Pierce it, and being a Raider, it's might just be the right, perfect package for him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, if he can keep that up and everything stays well and, and he's liked in the locker room and he keeps that young group in line. Hey, I think he can be an all pro and he's going to be huge for this Raiders team, especially with the teams they're going to be facing in the 2024, 2024 slate. Go ahead. Yeah, one quick self correction. It was it was shabby twenty four with the call before Jacob, and he all you know he talked about the offensive defense. I talked about Terry Wilson. I didn't want to be too negative on that, but I want to add because yeah. he brought he also brought up Trey Tucker, yeah. and I agree with with shabby twenty four that it was good to see Trey Tucker get those big plays because he struggled with drops drops practices. You, you heard it with every practice report. He has right. he had some drop issues, and I wondered whether he would lose some snaps to Brock Bowers. I think he still will because of how great Brock Bowers could be. But it was good to see him on the field and get his confidence in, in live gameplay and get those big plays downfield. Especially that that long catch of his. If you remember last year, there was another one from Aiden O'Connell down the sideline, exactly the same, and he dropped mm -hmm. it. He dropped so, it. Mm -hmm. So to me, that to your point, great, great sign that Tucker's kind of got some of those issues and he's working hard. And we've heard a lot of that coming out from the beat writers right out of practice is that he's worked really hard yeah. all all camp and that he's been very impressive. So hopefully that continues through the rest of the preseason and into the regular season. So all good. Listen, thanks to everybody who called in for the Raider Nation mailbag. If you want to be part of it on our next show, 702-900-7869, 702-900-7869. If you're watching us, it's there on the screen. If not, it's in the description on the podcast. If you forget you're driving, you can't deal with it. It's okay. The number's right there along with your special link to bet us for our promotion. 
right? There you go. All right. So Mo, let everybody know what you got coming up the rest of the week. I know we'll be back on Thursday, but what do you got in between my man? I have a sports net piece coming up. My five takeaways that I got from the first preseason game. Again, these are not overreactions, but some of the things that we talked about, some things you can look at and say, okay, this could be an issue. This could be a strength. This is a positive. This is a negative. I have five of those over at Sports Not. I'm also going to be live after the Raiders second preseason game against the Dallas Cowboys. It'll be 1 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm doing this Ooh. for y'all people out there. I'm going to be up at 1 a.m. doing a Bleach Report Live talking to you all about who's going to win the cornerback position. What do you think about the offensive defense? And our final takes before the Raiders kind of whittle down their roster, before, you know, after their last preseason game. So look out for that one over our Bleacher Report. He's up at 1 a.m. going on a late night run for food anyway, guys. Don't listen to him. He's not <laughs> staying up. I'm just kidding. No, it is. Those games, man, those late games being on Eastern time zone, since since I'm still only a few years into it for the first time in my life, Man, it, uh, those Sundays are long, as you know, Mo. I don't have to tell you, but, it, it, you know, and you guys are out there saying, oh, you guys get to cover football. What are you complaining about? It's true, but it's tiring, man. When you don't take it to bed till three or four in the morning and you got to get up at eight, kind of stinks. Yeah. But you and all have. The age of when you're over the age of 35 and it's a struggle to stay up past midnight. Yeah. <laughs> Kill them. Anyway. But uh, maybe make sure you uh, check that out. Also, make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. If your friends that are Raider, part of Raider Nation haven't subscribed yet, as my dog is moving my camera. Hey, sorry, my dog is in the studio here moving my camera. Um, make sure you get them to subscribe to the show here. Also, check us out on YouTube. He's moving it again. Hey, Scout, get out of there. Get out of there. Sorry. Dogs. What are you going to do, man? Dogs. Raider dog, Raider dog 525. <laughs> oh, anyway, subscribe to the YouTube page or wherever you're watching us, whether it's on Facebook, on Rumble, on X.com, wherever you're watching us, make sure you give us that subscription. We would appreciate that very much. Mo, my friend, I will talk to you again on Thursday. Talk to you then. All right. For our producer, Mike Robbie, for Momo and I'm Scott Branson. This has been Silver and Black today. Thank you guys all for being with us. We appreciate you more than you know. Even those that you, do, even those of you who don't like us, it's okay. As long as you watch, we're happy. Bring it on. Give us your comments. Tell us how to make the show better, and we will listen. We appreciate it. Have a great rest of your week, and we'll talk to you on Thursday. Bye bye.